all, I just want to welcome you. Um, uh, you I think many of you have seen the new um, worship SOP, you know, and, you know, released by the government. And, you know, it's not going to be easy for us to meet on site. So I think we're going to just continue having this kind of online gathering for a while. But if you really, really, really want to be on the site, you can let us know and we can accommodate some people, okay? Okay, so before um, I do my teaching, we have a couple of testimonies. So I'm just going to hand over the time to, uh, to Adele and then later on, Jared, okay? So they are on site, so you can just go up and yeah, give your testimony. testify about the Lord's um, goodness and His healing. I want to praise the Lord. Um, yesterday, I really had a very bad migraine that I normally don't have. And uh, throughout the whole day, it was really um, hard to sustain. And, uh, and when I shared it with uh, our, um, our pastor and also uh, Lanshi, um, they really, um, really supported they really supported me and also they, they lead me to prayer. And um, after that, uh, taking authority by myself to declare uh, victory over my life and uh, to command the enemy to leave. And I, I praise the Lord within seconds, I was healed and, and I, I don't have that headache at all until today. And I praise the Lord for that. Glorify his name. And um, I want to also testify second testimony, which is um, uh, with my husband. Uh, we actually, okay, <laughs> um, actually during M MCO, it was really uh, soul searching and for me and um, really looking at the purpose and uh, my identity in my life. And, um, and really, it really bring me back to the prophetic words that's been released since last year. And it really bring, bring that alignment and that clarification to, for me uh, into what I ought to do and to be. And which it leads to um, uh, really totally no longer in full-time teaching, but I'm now full-time working with my husband. So I just want to uh, testify of his goodness because he is really teaching, uh, giving me and giving us a new role, not just husband and wife, but, um, but really a new role to go into as business partner and co-worker together. Praise the Lord. Yeah, we want to praise God really for uh, the prophetic word. And we want to praise God for God's timing and season. Uh, during the MCO, our business was doing well. No problems. Um, but then, when the MCO came in, uh, also it was okay. We had enough buffer and uh, reserves. But then, as, as it prolonged two weeks and another two weeks, then we started to think, hey, this is not going to end very soon. So, we by the teachings and by the trainings, we learned so many things. And we went back to our prophetic word, which was spoken in November. And um, uh, I just really want to give God, because we are new in, in, in this new move of God, and we just uh, want to obey what the Lord said through the words of our leaders. So we went back to the prophetic word, we prayed over it, and we do it. And the, and the Lord just brought new boundaries to open before us. Uh, 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 we... He told us that why, if I can make you prosper even better, why not? You know, why, why not? Why, why, why would you want to limit me by how you're going to do, how you were doing business in the past? I'm, I'm so ready to give you so much more. And, and, and the Lord brought us to people. And one of the prophetic words that really spoke to me was, I can begin to trust people. I, begin, I can begin to work with people I can, you know, the Lord will bring people that I can work with. So I really, because I am not that myself. Uh, um, because in business, you know, it's a more or less a one-man show uh, business that I run. I do basically everything. So 
it's a, it, it required a ready change of mind. It wasn't easy, but it just had to be done. And once that was done, we can just see the Lord just lining up uh, the path one step at a time, one step at a time, and one step at a time. So I just really want to thank God for, uh, in this, especially in the month of, 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 of provision this month, not, not the Lord brought us people, the, broad, the Lord brought us new resources, and from our, I can say before this, our business was small. It's just limited to Malaysia. But as of today, uh, we already ship our products to four countries. And if you would, if you would ask me, was, was this what I imagined or we planned for before MCO? It was not at all. We couldn't even imagine this. But we remember during the, the start of the year, right? You know, we, we declared new boundaries will open. And really, the Lord is just extending beyond our imagination. Uh, you know, a, a simple uh, a shop business that can that have can reach out to, 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 to more and more countries. Wow, we just we just say, Lord, you you are really so sovereign and you are really so good. So the prophetic word is so it's so crucial and operating in God's timing. It's it's really important. So that is something new we we learn and we are really greatly blessed. And another testimony is. Uh, uh, I've been trying to sell my big bike for since January because I want to change another bike. But for business purpose now. So since January until now, six months, quiet. Last week it was sold. And I'm and, and not only just sold, I made even a 10% profit. Where got people sell sell your vehicle and make profit? even made 10%. So God really is precise. He is really just spot on. We, and, we, and we just allow our ears to heal and He will just work. Yep. And also my, my, my rental at my shop, didn't in, it, it just went through a renewal and there was no increase at all for the next two years. So praise God for that. You know, just praise God for that. Yep. Anything else? Yes, and I want to thank God. Uh, okay, Andrea gave me the green light. So it, uh, we got brought us with Vav Ventures uh, uh, to work in setting up a website for our company. And since setting up the website for our company, it was simple, it was easy. Uh, uh, of course, got good rate. Lah, huh? uh, and, and because of that, we had the platform to expand our business. So we, we just want to give God the glory for bringing us people for personally first bringing me my wife to be my 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 my, my co-founder she's not just uh, she's co-founder with me and we ref we have refuted every every say in the world that says husband and wife cannot work together so we understand god's god's um, uh, uh, working and god's will is for men and wife to stand together and through that he will prosper so we are seeing that and god brought us god brought us people Bob ventures god brought us the prophetic team we just just praise God for that. We cannot do it alone. He brought us people and that's why he's, uh, he's just bringing us uh, to where he wants to bring us for his purpose. Yep. Amen. Amen. And I want to also continue in that, that in during MLM, that's one of the leadership training. It really brings us that awakening about the double curve, uh, S curve growth. That, that what Jared said that, yeah, we are actually doing quite well, but it's really awakened us that though you are doing well, it doesn't mean you will continue to do well. If you are going, unless you uh, continue to grow higher. So it really applies in our business and also in our spiritual growth that we have to continue to grow higher and higher so that we will not go down to that S-curve growth. So I really praise God for all the trainings that have been given to us. And, and it's really... In the end, I want to testify, it's really mind-blowing because we just launched our website on Tuesday. And, and as of this morning, it reached to four countries already. So every single day is like bringing us uh, new, uh, new territory ground. So it really, this month of Zebulon is really a, a territory ground that to, for us to claim and it's resources that the Lord is really providing. I really... Thank God for, for understanding more of the timing and season of the Lord. Yep. Really praise God for that. Amen. 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 Yep. Okay, that was a really, really good uh, testimony. And now if you have any um, testimony that you have uh, compiled during these few months, uh, feel free to let 
uh, Joyce or myself know, and we will lo love to hear from you. Um, okay, let me just share my slide now. Now today I'm going to do a teaching which uh, I've done before, and you know usually you know in the past season I don't really like to recycle my message, and you know every time I do it, uh, you know that's it. But the Lord has been reminding me that we need to begin to lay certain foundation. So for the Sunday gathering, I'm going to just relay certain foundation that you know we have been learning and. You know, maybe some of the things we, we take for granted, you know, it's like 10 years already in the apostolic prophetic move, but we always have new people. We always have, um, you know, just different setting and different season. So I want to just do this teaching again, um, because last week, if you attended our, our gathering, you know, we talked about one of the things is it, really the importance of reading the Bible, consuming the word, so I want to do a teaching on the power of the word. And, um, you know, I've just been thinking about this, that, you know, I was really fortunate when I was in university for seven, eight years, that that time God really helped me to, to put in the word that provided the foundation for what I'm, I, I was supposed to do the next 10, 20, 30 years. So, so do not stop, um, do not... Um, we have to invest, you know, basically how much you take the word of God into your being will really just determine how high your prophetic, how high your apostolic, how high your pastoral, whatever gifting that you, you have been given by God, that word foundation is really important. Okay, so some of you may have heard this teaching before, but it's okay, you know, you, and many of you have heard like FIC like 20 times. So, so I don't think it will hurt, okay? Now, remember we talked about this last week. If you miss this teaching, how to continually grow in this season, and we're going to put out the, the Zoom recording in YouTube soon. So there's a few things there, but I want to focus today on the first one. Go deeper into the Word of God, okay? And now the first thing we have to remember is the Word has been given to us. And what, what I really want to encourage all of you after today is there will be that, that love, that discipline for the Word of God. Now, before I continue, I just want to mention that after the teaching, uh, we're going to have a, quite, a very interesting session where we want to be able to just go into the breakout rooms and maybe some of us have certain prayer needs that we want to share and just be able to minister to one another. I, I feel that is something that will benefit uh, the entire tribe. So after I finish, uh, Joyce will do that and just arrange for people and, you know, just let it be organic, let, let it be natural. You, you know, don't, you know, we, we have been doing online training for, for, for quite a while already. So people are sort of used to interacting. So I'm just going to um, go into the teaching now. So when we talk about the Word of God and we really have to start from the Gospel of John, John 1, 3, all things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being. Now remember, Jesus was the word. Jesus is the word. And then we look at other verses that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we see that the character of Jesus as the word doesn't change. And the word has a sustaining effect on life and over the entire creation. And, and that's why, you know, sometimes you hear all the greenies, all the environmentalists say the word is going to end. That, that's just baloney because the, the word Jesus himself is sustaining. Yes, there is a time frame. There's going to be a new heaven. There's going to be a new earth. But we, we don't need to worry about that because things that has been uh, destroyed, even though humanity may not be a, a good steward at times, but the Word of God still sustain the entire creation. Then when we look at the Word, that, that is the, the Bible, it has to be consistent with the character and words of Christ because they are the same. When we read the Bible, it is an interaction with Jesus. So I already mentioned this verse, Hebrews 13, 8. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and some of you will be like, you know, why is the word Jesus? Because 
that is the way God chosen to reveal himself. And in fact, the time that Jesus came and did what he did at the cross, that signified the beginning of last days. So we have been in a season of last days for, for the past uh, 2,000 years. So, you know, sometimes people look at the political upheaval around the world and say, oh, we're in the last... We, we have been in last days for, for 2,000 years already. But now we are entering into a season of kingdom maturity and, and there will be just great warfare. That, that's why this is a time that everyone must learn how to war, how to rest at the same time. And it's not a contradiction, but it is just a, a basic requirement for us to advance the kingdom of God. So one of the things that we can do to gain further revelation of the word is really the faith. See, at the end of the day, that faith must come from you and me. We have to be able to read the Bible and say, I am wanting that to apply to me. Because we are really communion, uh, communing with Jesus himself. Okay, now I want to, to quickly talk about the four levels of the Word of God. And I think many of you have seen this before. You know, the four Greek words, graphe, logos, not rima, rema, and zoe. Okay, so I'm just going to go very quickly um, because today we have a, a bit more slide because we're going into foundation. But I still want to keep within time. So graphy, what is graphy? You know, and, and that's the same word we get from today's English word graphite. You know, graphite is like carbon. It, it, it's like, it, you know, it's like writing, that kind of thing. So it is what we call the written historical word of God. So what is the thing about graphy is that believers and unbelievers can read and understand the Bible from this perspective. So, so often you see on television, you see uh, even on articles, you have this professor of Old Testament, professor of New Testament from this and that university. And many, many of them are not believers. They are not born again. They are looking at it from a critical analysis point of view. So, when you read the word at this level, graphi, graphe, you understand the story and perhaps even the historical value of the Bible. I mean, I remember I saw a show and they were talking about um, Joshua and all his conquests. And they'll be like, oh, you know, this can be true, that can be true. And it's like, you know, very obviously, these people are not believers. They are looking at it purely from a historical value. And maybe you can think about the, the character, the setting, you know, those kind of things. You may think, you know, how old Babel, how is it like? What was the Garden of Eden like? You know, those kind of things, purely from a factual perspective. You know, I talk about Jericho, you talk about what, what is the geography like? You know, is the Healy, you know, those kind of natural things. But then when we engage the world at graphic, graphic level, there is little else that you receive from reading this kind of work. So, so unbelievers, believers, we all can read that. Then the next level is what we call Logos. Now, of course, Logos, um, you, you know, most of us, we know that this is what it means with the written word of God. Now, some of you, a few years ago, we have the Logos ship, you know, selling books. In fact, Logos has been retired. There's a Logos too. So we, we know what it means. It, it is the written word of God. But what makes it different from Graphe is that there is more moral emphasis on this. So, you know, do good, don't steal, 10 commandments, you know, those are logos. And it concerns with principles or values of which one can learn. But let me just tell you right from the beginning, you know, I, I, I came from a very evangelical background. You know, we're always looking at the logos, logos, logos. You know, I, I never knew how to prophesy. I never knew how to speak in tongues for a long time. And so that was the way I was trained. And... And that's the thing that they can focus so much on logos that the revelation gets stuck. And, and you know, I've just been thinking about this for a long time because what really kills the revelation is, is of course, we, in this part of the world, we have strong Confucius spirit, you know, that just causes us to be very square. But then when you add that with the Greek mindset, 
that's really a killer because you overanalyze, you overthink, you we do not allow the creativity of God. So, so that's why we have to understand that so many of us, when we read the Bible, it is at the level of Logos. But, but I, I want us to, to move on because Logos is the foundation, but revelations must be added. So let me give you an example of Logos. So we can understand, for example, the law of sowing and reaping. You know, uh, you know this principle was started off you know, after the flood. And, and remember, Noah was doing all the things, sacrificing this. And then God say, God began to declare uh, this principle. So, so very interestingly, that even though Logos is a written word and it has a moral principle, it has spiritual principle, both believers and unbelievers can benefit from reading the Logos. The other day, my father-in-law just, just told my wife that he wants a, a big print Bible or so. So you see, people are reading this and maybe they look at it as a historical book, uh, as a good um, resource for a certain perspective. But for us, we accept the Word of God as Jesus Himself, that interaction with God. Very, very different approach. So we see the example for Jews. You know, many Jews are not born again believers. They don't recognize Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But yet, they became very prosperous by following the instruction of Torah, the Word of God. So we see that you can have Logos. Even unbelievers can pluck and pick certain principles from Logos that allows them to prosper. So unfortunately, there's a huge segment of believers also. They just stay here. You know, they, they just don't want to consider. And, and that's why the next level is really where we begin to be shaped. And I, I think many of you, you know this word, Rema, okay? So everyone say Rema. Now, of course, the, the, the understanding of Rema is nothing new. You know, even in the 60s, 70s, you know, the... The, the, the Holy Spirit move, the charismatic move, you know, they already talk about Rema. And this is really when the word, the Logos, crosses into revelation. It becomes a revelation. And it is when graphe and Logos, because remember, you, you, when you read the written word, either it's from a graphe perspective or Logos perspective, they are suddenly illuminated. Now, what do we mean by illumination? You read something and then just imagine there is a light shine upon that. So suddenly, the word is revealed. Suddenly, the word is highlighted. Suddenly, certain points jump out. And this is done by Holy Spirit, not your intellect, not your brain, not your training, not your analysis, not a commentary by other Christian believers or authors, but it is Holy Spirit Himself giving that kind of illumination. And, and then, of course, your own spirit bears witness to you. To you. And, and, you know, when we read the, the Word of God, it, it's like how deep you want to go in. What is the construction? What is the understanding? What is the link? So all these are, are remas, a, a, a sudden revelation. And in this instance, your spirit, I'm talking about your human spirit, agrees with Holy Spirit. Now, one of the, thing, one of the easiest ways to understand rema is through our own salvation. A person is only truly safe when there is a rema understanding for the need for Christ as his Lord and Savior. I mean, I mean, have you ever met a person that they went to a meeting, maybe it's an evangelistic meeting or whatever kind of meeting, and then suddenly there was an invitation to come out to receive Christ, and it was an emotional moment, and they go out, and then they come down, and after a few hours or a few days, you ask them, oh, so... You know, you believe Jesus. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I don't. Actually, I, I didn't know what was happening. I, ever encounter that? <laughs> I've encountered so many of those. And, and that's because they didn't have a rema revelation of the need to be saved. They have an emotional pull. They felt the power of persuasion on. So that's why when we, when we do evangelism, it's very important. We need to remember what Apostle Paul said. I do not come to you with words of persuasion, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's very important in everything that we do. The supernatural um, undergirding has to be there. So, so that's the thing we, we always need to remember in everything that we do. 
So, so that's Rema. And this is a very famous verse, Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing. So faith can come from hearing. Hearing what? Hearing by the word of Christ. And this word, word here in Romans 10, 17 is actually Rema. That's why the faith can only come from revelation. Faith cannot come from graphe or logos. It's just not enough. So that's why this is one of the most important things. Before we have any download or revelation, you know, so many of us, we want the revelation. Faith must precede. Faith must come first. Faith has to be that ingredient. And we have learned all this in the activation, okay? You know, MSG, one, two, three, four, all the activations is all about this. Okay, so the last one uh, is what we call Zo, Zo or Zoe. Okay, I think some, some people pronounce it Zoe. And it's often translated as life in the Bible. So that's why sometimes, you know, we feel like, oh, it's not so significant. But in fact, this is an even higher level of words because this is when the word goes into your life. It is when the word of God produces life within a person. That means the word of God supernaturally change your behavior, change your outlook, change your priorities. And, and that is what we meant by we're being changed, we're, we're becoming more glorified day by day. It, it, it is through this receiving, it is through this understanding of word and of course the communion with Jesus himself. With Zoe, a person becomes creative. And, and really, you know, one, one of the purpose I, I do this is because lately I've been seeing people prophesying and, and a lot of people are struggling also. They've been doing this for a long time and they just felt the creativity was not there. And, and one of the reasons immediately the Lord reminded me is they have not consumed the word at the Zoe level. So you see, when you allow the Zoe, you allow the word to become Zoe, you become creative and you make yourself a willing instrument of God. So in order to do that, you, we have to yield strongly to God. Yield means we, we submit and then we allow the Zoe word to produce life. And that will come with fruits. That will come with manifestations. And I'm just reminded of what Apostle Vanner said the last few masterclass for those of you who join. Really, at the end of the day, if someone says, this is what I am, this is what I want to do, better have some fruits, better have some manifestations that can be objectively tested. Now, when the word becomes Zoe, that, that reached that, this fourth stage level, it actually dwells within, within you and me, within the believers, okay? And our conscience, our character are actually shaped and driven by this Zoe word, which I'm going to talk a bit later on, you know, how the word of God at the end of the day, what we want is really our conscience becomes clear because when you have a clear conscience, you can see God and suddenly the creativity to prophesy, to, to create wealth, to heal, to impart, to disciple nations, all those come from the starting point of a clear conscience. And, and that is one of the reasons why deliverance inner healing is such a priority for us because anything that kind of cloud and taint our conscience, that really will keep us stuck. And, and, and I know some of you will be like, oh, why do we need to do this again? Why do we need to do that again? Because there are so many things that just hinder us from seeing God and from um, expressing the fullness of what God has in store for us. So when we allow the Zoe words, and now I'm just going to tell you now that there will be certain words in the Bible that become Zoe in your life, that become so important, that becomes a guiding principle. And you and me, we have to ask God what word has become Zoe in our life. So at the end of this teaching, I'm going to show you a list of the word that, that has become Zoe in my life throughout the years, okay, and it's different in, in um, different seasons. So another way to see Zoe is it is really what we call sustained Rema. You know, Rema is a revelation, but, but sometimes revelation come and that's it. It's a one-off thing. 
But when you have Zoe, that revelation is like ongoing. It's always the baseline truth for us to do. So for example, when we understand, let's say the principle of first fruit, it becomes Zoe because we are being led by that. Our whole belief system, when we believe in Sabbath, our whole belief system, it, it revolves around that, the need for rest. So, so those are the things that when it becomes really part of you within the core of your inner man, that is when a certain word has become Zoe level. Okay, now let's move on. Now, what is the goal for reading Bible? I, I know it's like a very, you know, very strange question. But you see, our goal when we read Graphe Logos is so that it will be eventually become Rema and then it will become Zoe. It becomes the life principle for, for us. You see, the Word of God can be read so most people just read it, but reading is not the same as meditate. Meditate, you begin to put more focus. Then you study, which is even more focus. You can just, you know, I remember the days that we were like so serious with the Word of God. I mean, it's like we go to a, to a Bible camp. It's like five days and we'll be talking about four chapters. Five days, four chapters. And it's like, just look at it from every facet. So sometimes when you study, you, you, you just zoom in, you're going for the depth. You're you are not wanting to read many, many chapters. So we need to understand that there is a time for that if we want the Zoe word to be produced in our life. Now we all must find our own discipline. And so, so remember last week I say, attending Bible study class is good, but that is not studying the Bible. That is not reading the Bible. That is for you to come and see, you know, where am I? Have I understood it a bit more? And uh, yeah, I mean, our Bible study is structured in a bit, a bit more like teaching. So that, that's not the time for you to read the Bible or to study. You have to do that before so that when you come, you're really benefiting. So we all have to find our own discipline and how to flow, um, how to take the time and, and how to study. And if, you, if we don't know how to do it, are there tools that can help us? Can we find someone to mentor us in this respect, for example? And we have to allow the word to go deep into our heart. Now, I want to talk a little bit about heart because biblically, our heart is the same as our mind. Okay, so heart and mind is here. Okay, mind is not here. Here is your brain, your intellect. So, so it's different, okay? So many of us have an intellectual understanding of the Word of God. Now, why I can say that? Because this was me many years ago. You know, I, I have great intellectual understanding. You know, I can just, you know, debate all kinds of things with people. But really, the mind and the heart, they, they, there is no genuine understanding until Rema, until, I'm spirit, until I was spirit-filled, and then the Rema can start to flow. So we need to have a true heart understanding. Many of us have a great understanding. Again, I can say that because that was me. And, and basically, one of the easiest way to, to look at greed is we, we tend to stay at, at logos. You know, we want principles. We want objectiveness. And, but basically, God is not like that. God is just so much more. And unfortunately, the tradition of man and and let me just say this to you, that this is nothing new because the Pharisees and Sadducees and the teachers of the law and the Sanhedrin in the early church time, they did the same thing. That, that Pharisaical spirit, um, already that time influenced by about two or three hundred years of Greek civilizations, it, it has always been there. So this is nothing new. You know, King Solomon said there is nothing new on earth. So that's why I really want to encourage people because you know, we don't want to stay here. We want to move into that next level of revelation. And you know, if we have this kind of great understanding, I mean, there are only two, there are, there are two results. Okay, one will be when we read the Bible, you know, everything is from, you know, we, we analyze this, we analyze that, you know, you know we, we know a lot of different perspectives. 
you know, it's a bit like what Apostle Paul say, you know, you have a lot of knowledge, but it only puffs you up. It only makes you feel like you know the word of God, but actually you don't. Then the other spectrum is when you open the Bible, you're like, oh, very boring, very sleepy. You know, what is this? Not relevant to me. So, so this is what the, the Greek spirit does. We stay at Logos. There is no freshness. Now, one of the reasons I really want uh, Judah to come again and, and you know, I, I think today's sound is, is much better compared to last week. And, and yesterday, the, the team also did uh, Judah before Apostles Banner's class. So really, I felt that, that, that lifted, that boosted the atmosphere. And that's very important because we are all about spiritual transaction here. We want the best environment that will help us to, to, to read the logos and then t- able to convert that into Rema and eventually Zoe. So that's why Judah is so important. Judah goes first every time. Um, you know, so we're going to do this for a while. I, I think at least till, till August and we will see whether we can come back again. Okay, let's move on. Okay, let's talk a little bit about heart, mind and brain. Okay, I already alluded a little bit to that. Now, heart relates to our human spirit. So it's a little bit um, neat. Now, some of you, sometimes you look, look at this teaching, you're like, oh, where does this come from? Uh, if you want a book to read, uh, there will be God's Unfolding Battle Plan, one of the older books we have. But when, when, when Apostle Chapias was talking about the mind war um, and, and the blood war, you know, he, he talks about all these things. Really highly recommended to read. Not, not a very, not an easy book to read, but if we allowed the Spirit of God to teach, it, it will really open up many things. So, heart is close to our human spirit. Remember the Word of God say, the heart can be deceitful, but at the same time, it can follow after God's heart. So, so King David, for example, follow after God's heart. But if we are not careful, it can also deceive us. A very interesting about heart is this is where faith originates. Because remember, we, we talk about uh, faith must precede any revelation. It has to come first before we are able to prophesy or, or, or receiving download. Now, mind is very similar. And sometimes when you study Old Testament, especially when you study Hebrew words, they, they are almost interchangeably. But it relates to our heart, okay? So, so it is very, it's next to each other, but it's a bit different. And it is a place where stronghold can be developed and new thinking originates. So we, we know this because that's what Romans 12 is all about. There is a renewing of the mind, but there is that tension, there is that warfare, there is that uh, contention between what we want and what we don't want to do. So I will talk about that. It's another way to look at it is a spiritual warfare battleground. So all spiritual warfare starts at the mind. And, and if we cannot overcome this, it, you know, then it will be very, very difficult. So that's why, you know, God's unfolding battle plan in the book, one of the first war we had to fight is really the mind war. Because if we don't overcome that, we just get stuck there. Now, what is your soul? You know, when we talk about um, evangelism, right? We always say saving soul. So it's like that is the essence of the person. That is where your emotions are. That is where your personalities are. But I think the most important part of soul is your will. Because since the creation, God never violates the will. And he, it, it is in such an extent that God allowed people to choose hell. God allowed people to choose rejecting Him because He created us as free moral agents. So the will is really one of the most important part of the soul and that really is the part that determines what you want to do, what you don't want to do and that is the part that is fully our responsibility as a believer. That's why we can hear many things. We can hear encouragement, exhortation, advice. But at the end of the day, what are we deciding to do? That is the function of the will. 
Now, so that's why the way we describe it is like this. This is the part that must be submitted to the Spirit of God. How? Through your will. When you lay down, when you yield. See, the, you know, when, when Jesus was talking about the vine, you know, I'm the vine, you know, abide in me. Remember those passages before he went to the cross? The whole concept is about yielding. We, cho we choose to submit. And, and that's why when we relate to one another, we also choose to submit. We choose to mutually submit. We choose to recognize a higher anointing. That's how trust comes into being. And, and so often, you, you know, you, you know, just now when, when I was hearing Jared's and Adele's testimony, that this just comes to my mind that there is, there is an there is an act of recognizing a, a superior anointing and, and that opens out their own path. And, and every time we hear this kind of thing, we are like just so glad to hear that and, and because we want all the people that we, we train to go higher and beyond where we are. That, that, is a, that is a genuine desire that we see. And, and when people can fly higher than us, you know, we, we are more we are happy actually because we also have a credit in, in the development of the person. Now, brain, what is brain? Brain is really our intellect, um, you know, central processing unit. I mean, that's for computer, but it's the same thing, you know, that, that's where you, 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 you do all the heavy work, etc. Now, here's the thing about brain. Brain can be overly greed. Now, you, you, you must, you have seen that I've been talking about greed a few times and also the Confucius mindset because those are really the limiting factor for us to embrace the Word of God. So we must be careful not to be overly analytical. Now, I'm not saying that you can't be analytical. I, I can be very analytical. But we are, we are saying that we can be too analytical which causes to develop anti-faith. That causes us to question everything. And, you know, question everything is it, okay. You know, Job did that, Peter did that, Apostle Paul did that. But at the end of the conversation, talk with God, come up with a conclusion very, very quickly. Don't keep on arguing. Don't keep on having the doubt. You know, I just reminded of the story, Chuck Pierce, why Pam Pierce and it's really an amazing testimony and you know the story they you know once in a while they will share and it's really when you know they she had a twin and it died immediately after birth i mean of course they, they have the diagnosis already but they, they should go through the whole process and after that you know she was like okay you know i just had to move on and you know she said i, I will be strong and that offended people because people thought she should be mourning, she should be having a certain kind of emotions. But then her reply is, if I don't submit to God now, when then? Because the moment we chose not to submit, or you know, I'm not talking about mourning can be, um, can be an open door to trauma and things like that. But I'm just saying that when we don't accept what's happening very quickly, potentially there will be this kind of things that will cause us to develop anti-faith. So that's really something that between you and God, you know, we, we, we don't judge you. Um, but this is something that we have to watch out that can cause us to get stuck. And this is not the season to get stuck. It, you know, this is a season to really go all the way out, really allow our potential to be released. Okay, let's move on. Okay, now this is a picture. Um, of course, you, you can see this in God's unfolding battle plan. And I'm not going into detail, but it just shows a separation between body, soul, and, and the green part is a spirit. But you can see the heart, the, mind, the heart is really closer to the spirit. The mind sort of sits between the spirit and, and the soul. And, and this is from a very Hebraic perspective. When we look at, you know, the, the, the older verses, that, that, that is in the Bible. But of course, the moment that we are saved, Ephesians 2, 6 says we are seated in the heavenly. And, and that's why there is that power, there is that potential, the blood of Christ through the Holy Spirit really can, can, can cause the, 
the, our conscience to be clear. But it all starts, and I'm going to show you later, it all starts with the consuming, the reading, and the study of the Word of God. So today, I, I know some of the teaching here can be a bit technical, but if you don't remember anything else I say, just remember that we start at the Word. We start at the consumption of the Word. And eventually, they will lead us to have a clear conscience. Okay, moving on. So Psalm 11 says, Your words I have treasure in my heart. So, so now we see a principle that is very important. The Word of God, it is possible to put inside our heart. It is possible to receive it in a way that it stays in the heart, that you remember that it becomes the guiding light of your life. See, the Word of God must penetrate deep into our very core. And when we say core, we're talking about the inner man, our human spirit. And then it also goes into our subconsciousness. It, it affects everything we do. When the Word is received by our heart, it stays within. And, and that is when the Word becomes Zoe. That's why all of us, we have to have the goal that the Word that we read we have a Rema understanding, but eventually you reach, you reach a stage where it is always with us. It, it is such a fundamental truth. It is a fundamental word that everything we do is governed by the Zoe word. So guiding light, I already mentioned. And, and in the process, we have to learn to submit our will. So I already mentioned that your, the will is your soul. That is the one thing that you and me are responsible because we have to choose to, to, to accept the authority of, of the word. So today, you know, you have seen people and because of traditions, because of historical training, because of deceptions, because of lies. And, you know, Apostle Vanner was talking about it yesterday, about how there is a lie that, that we, women can't be in certain ministry. <laughs> so, so interesting. She said her first commissioning was well, what was that? Evangelist, because in her denomination, a, a woman can only be an evangelist. That's the highest level. So, I mean, that's just so ridiculous. So, 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 so these, are the, these are people who doesn't submit to the Word of God because the Word of God says there is neither male nor female, right? There's neither male or female. Why are we making this division? And, and that's a whole issue. So this is something that we have to decide. Are we going to submit to the Word of God? And, and you have heard people, they are against the new move of God. They say, oh, there is no such thing as contemporary prophets and apostles. The thing is, like, when they read Ephesians 4, they, they just chop off certain verses. So this is what I meant by there are so many aspects, and of course we are not exempted also, that sometimes certain truths in the Word we, we cannot submit, but it is a process. This is what we call the process of being perfected. We are not yet perfect, but we have to have more and more and more Zoe word coming into our life. That allows us to really, you know, that allows our life to be really governed by the word of God. So what is the key in doing all the above? And really, I think one one of the key, not the only key, of course, is we have to we have to see how the word, the Bible, the consumption of the word, and how that affects our spirit, causes our conscience to be clear. So we have to see the relationship. So I'm just going to go through some of the verses, um, hopefully real quick. Then, you know, we want to wrap up with this. Now, I already mentioned this. Another key, of course, is really the yielding, the submission that comes to the Spirit of God that comes from the decisions that you and me have to make. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this. Um, now, I talked about this uh, previously uh, and some people came to talk to me and they say it's very interesting and things like that. But I, I just feel like we need to... Um, now, now the, the reason is because I, I came from that kind of background that really gives me a, a very unique perspective on how people treat the Word of God. And so I, I'm asking a question that seems like a legal question, but just um, listen carefully and try to allow the Spirit of God to give you understanding. Is the Word of God objective or subjective? Now, now some of you will be like, oh, what is this? 
But when I say objective, think of, you know, think of it as neutral, impartial, defined, scope, limited. So I'll give you an example. If you read a, a, a Bible and people will say, oh, this is the interpretation. That is the interpretation. So, so they, they want a very clean cut, defined, everything is in the wall, that kind of thing. And, and really, when you study the gospel, that's what the Pharisees try to do. They're they are always trying to trap Jesus by saying, isn't it like that? Isn't it like this? But Jesus is very, very smart and, and he has a greater understanding. Of course, he has a greater understanding. He is the word himself, okay? So it's like, how do you argue with the essence? And anyway, this, this reminds me a bit of matrix, but I'm not going to talk about matrix today, okay? And, but subjective means when you read the word of God, it can be influenced by a person's feeling, principles, but the most important thing is it can be unique, okay? Now, I know some of you will be like, okay, this is getting a bit dangerous because this is not what I learned. My pastor never taught me like that. But just give me a bit of time and I want to spend just two slides to talk about this before we move on. You see, in the evangelical circles, and I, I used to come and you know, I already told you we, we, can, we can study four chapters in five days. There is a strict adherence to the objectiveness of the word. That means they always insist it's very objective. You can always explain it in a way that is acceptable. So, so the way I see is, in other words, they want to box the word. They want to put it within a boundary into a certain set of expectations, predictions, if you like. And now don't worry, if you don't understand this, I'm going to give you an example real soon. They want to predict how the word of God will be applicable in every conceivable scenario. They will say, oh, if there's divorce, what do you do? If there's corruption, what do you do? You know, they, they want like a FAQ. Have you been to a, to a, to a site, website? You know, recently I'm, I'm helping a hotel booking client and they say, oh, can you help us with the FAQ? I say, FAQ? I say, FAQ really depends on your operation. What do you do, you know? They say, oh, go, go and look at Agoda, go and look at hotels.com. And the FAQ is a long, very, very long, like hundreds of questions. So, so you see, that, that's the thing that the evangelicals do. Now, when I say evangelical, I'm talking about those people that stay in the Logos. They, they don't really allow a lot of Rema or Zoe to operate in their life. So it's like you do a long list of FAQ. And, and that's why over the time, you realize the church turned into that. We begin to have a lot of creed. We have the Nicene Creed, we have the Apostles' Creed, which is summary of the truth. Nothing wrong with that. But we become lazy and, and we don't go deep into the Word of God and we don't allow, most importantly, the revelations and the nature of Jesus Himself to affect our understanding of the Word of God. This is a very Greek approach. This is the fourth time I talk about Greek because it is really, you know, I, I always tell people once upon a time, you know, not, not many people can be as Greek as I was. Um, but by the grace of God, you know, I was able to break out from that mold. And, and that's why I really felt convicted and, and, and really the necessity to explain this, you know, as a foundation for us to understand. See, when we have a great approach, we limit the power. We limit the creativity. Because here is the Spirit of God that created the entire universe. Who are we to say that the Spirit of God can only function in such a manner? Okay, now let me give you an example, okay? For example, if a question is asked, how do we hear the voice of God? Now, I know all of us are activated. We do MSG and things like that. But just think about once upon a time before you were activated and you asked this question. And so many people, they do not believe they can hear the voice of God, even though Jesus said, my sheep can hear my voice. So those people with a very Greek mindset, they will use, they will say, okay, this is how you hear from God. They will use a biblical example. They will say, okay, look at how this person interacts with God. So they say, oh, let's look at Habakkuk. Because Habakkuk basically is like, he say one chapter, God reply, and then he say, and God reply, and then eventually it's okay, 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 I, I, you know? So, so it is an example of a prophet talking with God, a very clear-cut example. And they will look at the conversations uh, between the prophet and God and say, this is how we hear from God. I mean, it's like 
most people, if they are not being trained properly, they read Habakkuk, they won't be able to hear the voice of God. I can guarantee you that, okay? And so, so because of that, they will often reject any voice of God outside the written word of God. So their position is you can only hear from God from the Bible, the, the text. Now, of course, if we define the word of God as Jesus himself, I mean, so many people have conversation with Jesus, have an encounter with Jesus, have dreams. So many unbelievers, especially in the Arab world, nobody there to evangelize with them. They have vision of Jesus himself. Okay. So when you have this kind of approach, you are really saying that God is a person who has written a book and now suddenly can no longer talk. I mean, do you have any favorite author or, 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 you know, I don't know who is your favorite author, you know. And, you know, they write storybooks and things like that. And then, and then people will be like, oh, what, what is this? What is that? What is that? And then sometimes the author will be like, okay, you know, this is actually what I meant. This is actually what I meant. So, you know, the, the one who creates the word, of course, can have more voice. God's voice is not limited. But the word, of course, is the standard of which we use to test everything. It is the standard of which we grow but to say that that is the only voice of God is it, really doing God a great disservicing. So with people like, 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 like this category, they want everything to be summarized into lists of principles, easy to explain pointers. Actually, when I was, you know, I taught this a few times already, but yesterday as I compiled the, the, the note, God just reminded me that when people want this, this is actually lazy Christianity. This is, not this is someone that doesn't want to cultivate that relationship with God. They want to be told what to do. You see, this is not the season. I mean, in the pastoral church, so many people just want to be told what to do, but we are not in that season anymore. And I was just talking to Apostle Michel yesterday. I said, you know, the COVID-19, really God is eliminating those people who are not serious and those who want to be told what to do. You know, you think they will go online to, to, to listen and, and attend services? No, they will just, they, they will just disappear and, and become very worldly. So, so that's one of the things, that's an unfortunate thing. But in every season when God wants to advance the kingdom of God, there is a season of separation. There is a season of sifting, which is what is happening right now. God wants to know who is truly for Him and who is just kind of, very lukewarm and you know whatever come whatever come that kind of attitude he, 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 he is fed up with this category of people so I, I just want to encourage you that those of you who have been training with us and you know you have been just putting into effort God knows what you're doing and, and he will open that path for you real soon okay so if we have this kind of mindset, if we just want summary, we just want easy answer, then that will really limit how God can communicate to us. Okay, now this is a, a, a little bit long, the teaching, okay, but I'm just going to take maybe 15 min minutes more than my usual one hour, but I, I'll try to push on. Okay, there's, a few, there's still like maybe one third, okay. Okay, now we need to remember who Holy Spirit is, okay, very quickly. Remember, He is a person. He's not a force. He's not an energy. He has personality. He has feelings. He has will. You know, he's just like a person. He is God, okay? And he has godly attributes. You know, he testifies the goodness and all the acts of Jesus. And that is the reason why he cannot be boxed. You cannot say this is how Holy Spirit will behave. This is how he will manifest. Because he showed up like that last Monday, he will show up the same today. No, no, no. We, we cannot do that because he, he is God and, and he, can choose, he can choose to be gentle. He can choose to be forceful. He, he has his own will and agenda. He deals differently with different people. He will... He will do one way with you. He will do one way with me. But it's okay because he knows us well enough to know what works for us. He can relate to all believers at their unique place and perspective. So try to think of Holy Spirit as a personalized teacher. You know, he, Jesus called him the teacher, the counselor. And, and, and he really, he is, 
a, a teacher and counselor for you and me in a unique way. And the interaction is personal. And because it is personal, the only way to have this is it must be experienced. You can't read about Holy Spirit. You have to commune with Him. You have to have that conversation with Him. You have to have that interaction with Him. And, and how, how you do that is really different. Everyone, you, some have dreams, some talk to Him, some have monologue. And, and fine, just, just find whatever that works for you. Okay. Since Holy Spirit deals differently with every single one of us, they were bound to be subjective revelations of the word. Now, I have to be a bit careful here. I don't want you to misunderstand. By subjective, I mean when, you, when we read the same logos, when we read the same verse, it can sometimes produce rhema or even Zoe manifestation for, for different people. Now, I'm not talking about doctrine, okay? You see, um, I'll talk about doctrine a bit later. Is it? See, different people can read the same scripture and receive different words and of knowledge, words of wisdom for a particular issue, for a particular season. Let's say they're praying for something within their family. They're praying for something within their group or company. And suddenly the Holy Spirit shows them a scripture. They use that scripture that is only applicable for that scenario. It is not a doctrine. Doctrine must be established by the church. It must be established by the apostles, by the leadership of, of the overall church, okay? So when we refuse to accept that Holy Spirit can be unique, and, and, and that's the thing, you know, when, when we go back to the Greek mindset, to the Pharisee spirit, what they want to do is they want one interpretation. They want one way. And, and that is what happens uh, with Constantine, with the Roman Catholic Church, you know, after AD 300, 400, 500, they, they became like that and, and they went into 1,000 years of darkness because they became very religious. The, the religion becomes a way to control people. So even during Jesus' time, we saw that with the Pharisees. And you know, remember, they, they were asking uh, Jesus, you know, what do you think about Sabbath? Moses say we can have divorce. You, you, you see where they come from. They are trying to just limit the application. But the word himself incarnated as human gave them a reply that they cannot answer. So it's very, very interesting that we must be careful not to become religious. Because once we do that, people will stop receiving present truth. Now, I know most of us, we understand present truth but let me just give you a very quick um, definition. Simply means the emphasis and highlight of Holy Spirit for a given season. In every season, God is doing certain highlight. He is doing certain things on earth. Yes, we have a set of established doctrines which has been you know, established and affirmed over generations. So, so here I want to make a distinction between doctrine and revelation. Doctrines are established uh, by God and communicated through the, the leaders of the church, through the apostles, through the prophets, over a period of time, tested and agree. Okay, so doct doctrine takes um, time to develop, but revelations, it, you know, for a given time, for a given scenario, can be unique. Okay, like I gave you the example, we pray for something, God shows us the verse, and it has a certain meaning. So we can use that for that scenario only, but we can't use the same interpretation in a different scenario. See, that, that is what I'm talking about. So that we, we don't create our own new doctrine just from, uh, you, you know, just from the same thing. Now, of course, revelation can never contradict established doctrine. It cannot contradict the Word of God. So any subjective revelation can never contradict the Word. But it can expand the scope and give present time revelation. And, and, and we saw Jesus did that. We saw Apostle Paul did that. In, you know, just give more understanding. We saw that in the early church in Acts 15, you know, they have a certain understanding about, you know, um, how, how a person should behave. And then suddenly the gospel is shared to many, many Gentiles. And some say you need to become a Jew. But is it really like that? If they look at Old Testament, yes, that is the standard. 
but then God gave them revelation that caused them to establish doctrine. And, you know, really, so that's why they all came, all the top leaders came in Acts 15, and they said, yes, we shouldn't make it difficult, um, but, you know, they, they, they don't need to convert, but they shouldn't worship idols, they shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't eat food sacrificed to idols. There are three things there. And those three things are still doctrine for us today because it has been established by a company, by the government of God. But that's another topic, okay? Now, the other thing, of course, we talk about, uh, this is a very interesting verse, John 21, 25. And, it, and this is a really a verse for people who say that if you can't find it in the Bible, you can't do that. You, you know, you have, you have a group of people who are like that and, and they'll be like, okay, we don't want to use, uh, we cannot use electric guitar. So, so Mark, you can't play already because it's never mentioned there. We can use drum. Okay, like then we might as well don't use Zoom. Don't use computer. Just shut, just shut off everything now. <laughs> it's like so ridiculous. And, and this is what, this is actually the last verse of the book of John. And John recorded, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, the world itself would not contain the books that would have been written. That means there are so many things that is not written, but nevertheless, it, it, it includes the scope of what Jesus did on earth, what he said, and, and those kind of things. It, it, it is still his activity. It is still a communication by Holy Spirit, but it's not recorded. It doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that it, it is not the voice of God. Okay, one more, one, one more slide on this, then I'm going to move on already. Now, some people object to the nature of revelation or prophecy as being extra-biblical. Now, I, I don't even like the word. Um, when we say extra-biblical, we, we mean, you know what they mean, okay? Is if it is not in the Bible, it cannot be true or be used. But when we think about that, that really limits revelation. And, and that, that, that is not the way God intends it to be. And, and here's what, what I want to say about this. I mean, I'm going to finish with this portion already because I don't want to talk too much. But we just have to have that sort of conviction. We need to be very careful here because God never limits himself in such a way. He never said that if it's not in the Bible, it is not from me. He never said that. Find me a verse. You can't because it is not there. See, we can see many things which will be considered extra biblical if we use that definition. Yet, they are definitely from God. I just give you a few. And you know, I did this teaching before, but there are, there are many, many things we can find. But I'll just give you some obvious ones. For example, we have 66 books in the Bible, right? So you, you can't find that in the Bible. So how did the 66 books come about? I mean, it, it's a long process. And, and when you read uh, historical, historical account, you know, I think your faith might even be shaken a little bit. But it is not written in the word himself. Then, of course, we talk about restoration of present truth in church history. I know we, we use a verse in Acts 3 to talk about restoration of all things. But it, it never gives us the detail, you know, about Martin Luther, about all these things. And so, so it never talked about that this what happened. But, but it did happen. And, and, and that is part of our church history. Then, of course, we talk about on a practical sense. So many of us, we hear the voice of God for our destiny, for our place, for our season, potential spouse, family, movement, etc. Those are legitimate voice of God and yet you can't find them in the Bible because, because the Spirit of God still speaks. Jesus still speaks after he completed his book. And, and of course, it can never contradict that. But God is creative. He's creating new things. Then of course, we talk about social issues. And i just give you one example. Slavery. You, you know, you read the book Philemon, okay? Philemon is really, Philemon is a master of a slave who ran away. So in New Testament, slavery was acceptable and, and Apostle Paul did not feel the need to, to challenge the law of civil government at that time. But over a period of time, the, the church has come to a consensus that slavery is against the will of God. That is not, but that is revelation given in future that allows us. But it, it is still a revelation from God. 
And I can give you many, many more examples, but this will be enough for now. Okay, okay, I really want to go to the final part already and just quickly wrap up. Now, I know I spent a bit of time on the objective and subjectiveness. Um, I just want to help those who are a bit more Greek, a bit more Confucius. And I, I trust that the Spirit of God will speak to you and cause you to have the creativity to go higher. Okay, now going to go hyperdrive now again, very fast. Hebrews 4.12 for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as division of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, this is a very interesting and very deep um, uh, word, but we, we're just going to look at one portion here, which is it has the ability to cut through the division of soul. And, and here we see the problem. The spirit wants to do certain things. The soul wants to do another thing. And that is what Apostle Paul said in Romans, that the things I want to do, I don't do, but the things I don't want to do, I do. So there is that struggle. And, and the word of God can be a tiebreaker. It can be like a sword that begins to cut through. So we need to understand the spirit is willing, but the flesh is not. Okay? There's some reference there for you. The enemy attacks our soul. So that's the first thing. And that's why so many times when you look at deliverance issue, when you look at healing issue, very often the enemy starts with the emotion because that's the easiest thing to attack. It will try to destabilize your emotion. And what it does is when you cannot reconcile it, when you feel unhappy and you don't know why. And that's what maturity is all about. That when you have a certain maturity, your choice, your will overrides your emotion. And that is basically an application of joy because joy is choosing to, 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 to know the truth, to choose to stand in a way that is not affected by your emotion. But if we don't do that, then it begins to cause our soul to be fragmented, to, to, to be very divided and, and we become confused. Fragment means broken and, and you know it, it, it's like not whole not, not in one piece and, and this can happen to our soul and when it happens then it also affects our spirit it, it is bad now for those of us who are believer for those of us who are born again the spirit of God lives in us the enemy cannot touch that portion already that part is already redeemed that part, that part is already sealed but the soul is still an open game. It is free for all. That's why the enemy always attacks the soul first. Now, what do we mean by that? That means you are disturbed in a manner. You are disturbed. And you, you feel like not, not very nice and it's a bit disgusting. But even though the spirit itself is still protected, it, it, it cannot be touched. And one of the examples I, I use when we talk about vexation will be you know, if you go to, you know, places with, with long gang, with, with us, you know, all the places, very, very smelly one, but it's very dry, you know. So when you walk through those places, it's very, very smelly. You feel very vexed, but you are not quite contaminated. You are not quite dirty yet. So that's, that is a picture of vexation. It, it causes you, it, it doesn't affect you directly, but it, it causes your senses to be uh, not, not, not feeling very nice. But here's the thing, Hebrews 4.12, when we allowed the word of God to go into our spirit, and that's why it goes back to the first principle, consuming the word of God. If we allowed enough of that to come, the word cuts through our spirit and soul. It, it will cut through and it will cause our spirit to be free. So our spirit, talking about the human spirit, which is joined with Holy Spirit, we are free. And then it allows our spirit to commune with Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing. Have you seen a Christian born again, spirit-filled, and yet still are, are very affected by the fragmentation of the soul? Yeah, I mean, I think we have seen enough of that. And the reason is because the, 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 the vexation, they, they didn't, their spirit is not free because they have not allowed the Word of God to operate in their life. 
But if we do that, the Spirit can commune with with Holy Spirit. Remember the picture just now, Ephesians 2, 16, we are seated in the heavenly. Suddenly you can go there. Jesus, the chief intercessor, can begin to, to, you know, empower us. Then we do the necessary mending, healing, and restoration of our soul. Then we begin to fix the, the issue of fragmentation. And this eventually will cause our conscience to be cleansed. So this is another very deep uh, verse. We're not going too much into that. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more would the blood of Christ... Now, have you ever thought, you know, we say, we, we, say, uh, we, we always say, you know, we apply the blood of Christ, you know, in deliverance, you know, in house cleansing, spiritual warfare, you always do that. But have you ever wondered what is the mechanism? And Hebrews 9, 14 show us how much more would the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit. So you see, that, that is how the blood comes. The spirit of God, Ephesians 2, we are seated in, in the heavenly. And, and that's how the effect of the blood begins to come. And what can the blood do? Cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. So you see, there, there is a progression which I will show you a bit later. The blood, which is apportioned by Holy Spirit, begins to clean, cleanse our conscience. Now, what is conscience? It is really the link between our spirits and God's spirit. So try to think, it, think of it like a window in your spirit because your, your spirit, our spirit and Holy Spirit has access to heaven. That's why when we speak in tongue, very often we receive revelation. We go to the courts of heaven. And, and that's the reason. But then there is a window, and the issue is, is the window clear or is the window dirty? Because if the conscience is very dirty, even if we go to heaven, we, we cannot receive a lot of revelation. And, and, and that's why sometimes when people prophesy, they feel they get stuck, they cannot go deep. And very often, it is linked with the issue of conscience. It, it is not cleansed enough. Then, then the issue is because we, we didn't use the, the blood of Christ. Then why we didn't use is because our spirit is not free. Why our spirit is not free? Because it is entangled with our soul. Why it is entangled with the soul? Because we are not reading the word of God. So you see, it all goes back to, to the fundamental thing. You stop receiving the word. All, all these things are, are, are the side effect and it's going to affect us in a very negative way. So, so this is a way to, to look at it. There, there is that window there. That window is within your spirit, the small window. The big window it, it is the window of heaven. And, and that is one of the reasons, uh, again, I want to go back to Judah, that the purpose of Judah is actually to create an open heaven environment that, that allows us to, to receive revelations that, that can really help in, in cleansing our conscience also. Okay, a few more slides. Okay, I know I've sort of gone over time a bit. Okay, five more minutes will be done. So let's look at the progression. If we consume the word of God, you begin to read it, you begin to meditate, you study, you know, you really allow the logos to become Rema and then become Zoe, you know, then, then, then the word will reach that level, Rema and Zoe. And when you have that kind of word, that, that word can cut through the division between spirit and soul. Things I don't want to do, I keep on doing. Things I want to do, I don't do. But eventually, when the, when the work cuts it through, your, your spirit is free. And then our spirits be, begin to commune with Holy Spirit. We start to have that communion with God. And then the blood can be a portion. And then the blood will cause our conscience to be cleansed. And that is when we start to see God. When we can see God, everything changes. Um, it, it, it's like you can prophesy better, you have a higher anointing, your healing increase, everything changes because it, that's where the creativity, the anointing comes. Very interesting. I, I find you know, there's, a, there's a question, you know, and, and you know, uh, when we have uh, Apostle Werner Masterclass, somebody was asking, you know, why is it that sometimes people have their anointing and then sometimes they don't have on and off? And, and she said it shouldn't be 
And uh, I believe the basis will be if we have followed through this sort of discipline, allow the word to operate, then it shouldn't be. You shouldn't be. Sometimes can, sometimes cannot. You know, we talk about, you know, it's like sometimes you can prophesy and sometimes you cannot. I remember in the early days, we always had people like that. But that's really when we don't allow this sort of process to, to govern our spiritual growth. Okay. Conclusions. You know, I taught this four or five or six times already, even in KLM, but every time I felt like it's just a, a, a little bit heavy and, and, and really, it, it, it is something that you have to just listen carefully and then make a determination if you want this truth to apply in your life. It, it, it is that simple. It, it is not very complicated. If you say, I want this, then God will cause this process to be a reality in your life and, and you will have a clear conscience. You see, conscience is very important because you know there are certain things in the Word of God that is sin, you know, no, no compromise on sin, but then we, we are a place that really train people in the marketplace and marketplace, there are so many different cultures. It's not a matter of whether it's sin or not. A lot of things are not sin, but is it beneficial? Is it helpful? Is it appropriate? And that's where the conscience and the revelations and the creativity from God is so, so important if you want to make an impact in marketplace. So in conclusion, here's a few things to consider. Are we allowing the Word of God to cut through the divisions of spirit and soul? Now, of course, if you say you are allowing, that means you are allowing the con consumption, you are allowing the intake of the Word. And then when you do that, something shifts. Everyone say, shifts. Because we always want to have shifting and changing and changes that propel us into a, a, a closer perfection to what God has intended us to be. The entire process from reading the, the, the Word of God all the way to, to the apportionment of the blood, and it will cause our conscience to be clear. And this clarity is a way for us to see into the future. See, that, that's really the, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge that, that helps us to do many, many things. A clear conscience is, the Bible says, is a person with a pure heart. And Matthew 5, 8 says that if we are pure in our heart, it allows us to see God clearly. It allows us to prophesy more accurately. Or, or any of the gifts, you know, healing, miracles, word of knowledge, tongues, interpretation of tongues, anything, you know, all the spiritual gifts, that when we can see God, it allows us to do it at a higher level. Now, it doesn't mean that you will have the gift. The gift still comes from the Spirit of God. The fivefold gift still comes from Jesus himself. But whatever is your gift, if you, if you have a clear conscience, it just allows you to go to a higher level. It allows us to keep a check on our emotions. Uh, you see, because when your conscience is clear, you have gone through the process of purifying your, your soul and, and you, you don't allow emotions to... to you, you know, so many times we, we cannot overcome this. It, it, it's because the spirit, the, the conscience, that, that is really the, the, the thing that gives us that foundation and stability. But once we have that, we can always, um, you know, we, we can allow. Now, when I say keep in check, I don't mean by suppression of your emotion. I mean, we are not allowing it to cause us to be like shaking here and there. And, and, and that, try to think of joy. You know, joy is a choice. Faith is a choice. It's not a feeling. It's not a manifestation, you know. So, so those are the things that we have to uh, really understand. So often we cannot handle revelations because our emotions are unstable and not aligned with God's words. You know, I think of myself, you know, early days, you know, when, when, when I heard from God that, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to, to learn all the things about government and things like that, politics. You know, I used to get very disturbed about political news. And, and, and that's really the, the emotion part when it is not submitted then you read the news, you read like oh, you read all the 
evil things that the government is doing and you just feel very, very angry. You know, I'm not talking about the, the, the holy anger, but I'm talking about the emotion that really caused you to be unstable. So, so that, that is really one of the things that, you know, especially today, you know, we, we have the media and we have the government, we have the arts and entertainment, just very, very demonic. And that's why the people of God needs to go in and begin to influence it. So, so, so often we can get very emotional, we can get affected by that. But this whole process of, of being cleansed and being stable really will help us um, you, you know, to process revelation in a way that is really, really different. So again, I want to go back to the whole purpose of the, today's teaching. All this stability, all this cleansing of conscience, it all starts, everyone says starts. And it starts with us consuming. It starts with us reading the word in a way that causes Logos to be Rema and Rema to be Zoe. Now, now I want to now before I end, I just want to encourage you all just just do it, just find that discipline. And um, I, I know we are all busy and things like that, but but you you have we all need to invest a season of our life. You know, I'll be honest. You know, you know we have to do so many teaching preparation. You know, I don't get to read the word as much as I like to, but but you know the the seven eight years when I was in university, those time really. Give you know really helps me to have the foundation, but we, we have to continue, we have to maintain that. But I just want to say, if you never really invest so fully into the word of God, this is a great time to start, and you will be amazed by what God can do. Okay, the last slide I want to show you is I, I just want to show a little bit of my personal Zoe words. And um, over the period of years, I have, have just updated it recently. And um, just very quickly, and, and this really is a bit chronological also, because when I first became serious, when I first became serious with the Word of God, Philippians 3, 8, 13 really was a word that becomes Zoe. Don't look back. I, I never look back. You know, you ask those who know me, you ask my wife. I, I'm someone that moves on very quickly. I, I, I don't look back. Uh, and that's just one of the Zoe things. Then, then, of course, with all the Bible study and, and spending work, 2 Timothy 3.16 becomes so, you know, actually, when we talk about the word evangelical, the original meaning is really Bible, <coughs> excuse me, Bible believe it. <coughs> then we talk about the mind can be renewed. You know, John 1.1, 1, 1, the word is Christ. <coughs> Those kind of things that we have been talking about today. Talk about spiritual gifts, talk about the government, talk about equipping, Ephesians 4, moving into the apostolic. So this, you know, the dominion mandate, these, these are the things which is, which is personal to me, but I really want to encourage you, just begin to, to see, and um, you want to do a record of, of what, um, what, what, what kind of Zoe word that God has revealed to you that you have embraced, and that will really become part of you stepping into your destiny in days to come. So anyway, I, I hope that you have um, sort of uh, learned a little bit. Um, we're going to put the teaching up in, in YouTube a bit uh, sometime later so that, you know, if any of you, you, you need to review this again. And, and feel free to, to ask questions, not now because we're going into breakout rooms. But just begin that process that allows you to, to grow to a next level. So Father, I just pray right now that as we listen to all these things, that God, you're going to cause the Zoe word to rise up. And I just see like, you know, the Zoe word is just falling down from heaven and it's going to, into many, many places. And I hear the Lord say that I'm going to cause many of us to begin to have personalized Zoe word that will cause us to have a stability, that will cause us to have an upgrade. And, and the Lord says that, you know, if, if you're willing to invest into the Word of God for the next six months, you're going to have progress into the Word, into the understanding of Word that is more than even the last 10 and 20 years of your life put together. So I really felt like the Lord is saying that there is an acceleration grace 
that I'm going to give my people, they will prepare them just prior to the next Passover. They will allow them to go to the next level of kingdom expression. So we just pray and we declare all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So that's it for me now. And I'm going to hand over the time to Joyce and she's going to do the breakout thingy, okay? <laughs>